um, should be um, streaming live on the uh, Poor Hair Facebook page. So I'd like to welcome everyone who's uh, joining in right now. All right, so we should be live on uh, Facebook. And why don't we go ahead and get started? So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is an absolute um, joy to be here. My name is Dr. Akwi Asimbang, and I am the um, co-founder and board president of the Pan-African Organization for Health, Education, and Research. Um, our uh, speaker today, I am just very excited. I am actually beyond excited um, because we have Dr. Beverly Chesserum, who's a neurosurgeon. And for all those who know how neurosurgeons work, how hard they work, for her to take this time to spend with us, we are absolutely grateful and truly appreciate um, her time. Um, she's tuning in all the way from Kenya. Our moderator today is our one and only Poher Scholar, uh, Ivan Zolo. Um, Ivan Zolo is a Poher Scholar for 2021, but not only that, he is also the president, and I'm hoping I get this right, uh, president of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, and Ivan can correct me. And not only that, we should all start clapping for Ivan because Ivan got accepted and will be spending the year as um, a global surgery fellow at the University of Cape Town, um, South Africa. So Yvonne, I'm clapping for the whole world for you. We're super excited. So Yvonne is going to be our moderator today. Um, Derek and I are going to turn off our cameras and we will be in the background and we will just jump jump right in if there's any sort of um, uh, glitches. Derek, who is also one of our poor hair scholars, has an interest in pathology. So he's our future pathologist. Um, so him and I will turn off and we'll hand everything over to Yvonne and Dr. Chesserum, we look forward to this conversation. Can't wait to learn what it's like to be a neurosurgeon. Thank you so much for your time. Yvonne, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiku, for giving me the floor. Uh, I welcome everybody uh, to this amazing session by Poor. And uh, today we are welcoming Dr. Beverly Chesserum, as uh, Dr. Aiku rightly said. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me and honor for me to uh, host her today. So as uh, most of you might know, Dr. Beverly is uh, a neurosurgeon working in Kenya. She studied in the UK and uh, she has won a numerous um, number of awards and uh, accolades. Dr. Beverly, it's a pleasure having you. Please, can you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for that introduction, Dan. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Beverly Chesseram, and I'm presently based at the Khan Hospital in Nairobi, which is a university hospital. So I, I work as a consultant, but also as an assistant professor. Um, yes. <laughs> All right. So please, Dr. Beverly, uh, can you tell us who a neurosurgeon is? Who is a neurosurgeon? So a neurosurgeon is a doctor who treats people uh, who have neurological disease using surgical techniques. So uh, it covers a whole range of diseases from prior to birth. So we're involved in prenatal counseling for people who may have various neurological conditions uh, all the way up to old age. It covers a wide variety of disease pathologies, for example, um, and it covers the brain and the spine. Many times people think of a brain surgeon, they don't realize we also to manage the spine and other uh, disorders of the spine itself. So we cover pediatrics, oncology, spine, trauma, functional. This is epilepsy, pain syndrome, movement disorders, skull base, which are problems or any lesions on the floor of the skull itself um, and neurovascular. So these are abnormalities of the blood vessels that supply the nervous system, both in the brain and the spine. So it's a pretty a broad speciality. You typically have what you call the core neurosurgery. So that's this 50% uh, of your work is emergency. So we all cover the same things. If somebody comes with a, a, a bleed in the brain or trauma, then we all need to manage that. And then within that, all the things that I've mentioned are the areas of further specializations where you can you know, uh, do more of your elective work, which means the non-emergency work where you can develop a service around that, yeah. Mm, thank you very much, Dr. Bell. Please, uh, and uh, please, 
can we know more about your personal and professional background? I grew up in Nairobi. I was born and brought up in Nairobi and went through the regular public health system, uh, the public uh, education system, I mean, I can tell I'm being a doctor too much. I then had an opportunity to do um, a scholarship to do a, a British A-levels uh, in a college that no longer exists. It's called the Boretum College. When I finished, when I was coming towards the end of it, my tutors encouraged me to apply to the UK and I got accepted at the University of Southampton, which is in the south of uh, England, where I did my medical school. When I completed that, I did my internship at Bournemouth and then spent a bit of time trying to build up my CV um, initially not knowing what I wanted to do. So I went into medicine thinking I was going to be a community or public health doctor. And then during my training, I was exposed to very many different things I'd never seen before or knew they were possible. And uh, it is after my internship that I had thought maybe I'll become an ophthalmologist. So as part of preparing to be an ophthalmologist, an ophthalmologist is an eye surgeon. I spent some time at the Walton Center in Liverpool and I was really inspired by the surgeons who worked there and thought that maybe this is something I want to do. Spent a bit of time doing different jobs and building my CV, uh, eventually being accepted to train in the South London program. And when I completed that, I then did a skull-based fellowship in Cardiff, also in the UK, before I had an opportunity to be a global health fellow with Will Connell at the Mohumbili um, Orthopedic Institute in Tanzania. And when I completed that is when I came and worked in Aga Khan. So it's a bit of a round way to say that I started on a journey where I didn't realize I'd end up where I am today. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Beverly. And uh, please, what motivated you to choose a career in neurosurgery? As I said, I, I was really motivated by the surgeons in Liverpool. I had never really understood what a neurosurgeon does and they welcomed me to theater and to clinic and took their time to teach me and show me things. Um, so one of the, there, were, there are two operations in particular that I talk a lot about. One is called an endoscopic third ventricular ostomy. And that's where, when there's a buildup of fluid, otherwise known as hydrocephalus, where you can divert the flow in the brain by passing a balloon and opening up a passage in the flow of the part of the brain. Um, so I was welcome to theater and I watched this operation and I was really amazed by the idea that you could weave around the brain, the, the brain, basically in the ventricles, which is the fluid field spaces in the center, uh, and, 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 and do this operation that had really good effect and actually is a life-saving procedure in many parts of the world. And then the other end was uh, something called a deep brain stimulator, where you use electrical impulses delivered through various stimulation points to mod moderate or modulate various disease processes. So in this particular case, it's a patient who had had tremors and the tremors were so bad that he had become increasingly socially isolated and then also had stopped working, wasn't able to drink tea or anything hot. And uh, the consultant, it's a very complex process, uh, multi involving a lot of different people to get this patient to have this operation. And the following morning when we went to do uh, our, our rounds and the patient and the doctor asked, how are you today? The patient lifted up a cup of tea and drank that. And I thought this is a very interesting field where you can improve people's quality of life. Um, and yeah, so that made me think I'd like to explore a bit more about neurosurgery. Thank you very much. So, um, and uh, what do you like about being a neurosurgeon now that you are one? Because uh, getting into the getting into the field is a uh, part of the journey. And now that you are in the journey, do you like what do you like about being a neurosurgeon? Neurosurgery is a very interesting field. Um, there is a great variety. Uh, at the moment, I am I'm on call, which means that in the morning I can meet a baby, at lunchtime a teenager, in the evening an older person. And it's a whole variety of different conditions that come our way. So that's very interesting. It's ever changing. Your surgery is a young speciality compared to other surgical specialities. And that's because a lot needed to improve within surgery as a whole. We needed better anesthesia, better critical care. Uh, we needed better ways of controlling bleeding. So the ability to do really good quality neurosurgery is just over 100 years old. And that means that it's a field that 
a lot is changing. There's a lot of research, a lot of new ideas. It crosses over with the idea of neuropsychology and how does the mind work and why do people respond differently? So those things make me think I will never know enough in my field. And it's nice to, to have that thing that way you keep, it keeps changing. It's also very collaborative. You can't work alone. And so my field intersperses a lot with very other specialities. You know, this morning alone, uh, I've spoken to an anesthetist, I've spoken to an infectious disease consultant. Other days I speak to neurologists, ICU specialists, um, ear, nose and throat ophthalmologists. So I, I, I don't have the whole, I'm always working with other people to bring, uh, improve my patient's care. And that's, that's very interesting. And then it's also life-changing as well as life-saving. Life-saving, you know, we think about things like stroke, where there's a high mortality or um, trauma, which in our part of the world is high trauma. There's an opportunity to literally save a life within the team, you know, the team, um, but also to change lives. We deal with, for example, in spine and also some cranial conditions, we deal with pain, we could deal with deformity, um, and you can give somebody back their life, you know, uh, by giving them the right treatment. So that's interesting and that's exciting. Certainly anybody who is following this talk wants to do, wants to do neurosurgery now. But unfortunately, uh, nothing, is, nothing is ever perfect in the world. So uh, what do you dislike about neurosurgery? What are those small aspects that maybe you don't appreciate that much in neurosurgery? Um, well... It's not, I suppose dislike is a, is a strong word. What I'd say, what are the challenges of doing your surgery? One of the greatest challenges is that it's a high risk speciality. And that means I can do my utmost best for my patient and they could still have a bad outcome instead in terms of losing their lives or disability. And that can be really, really hard to, for you as an individual and also for your team when they have put everything in for the patient and it didn't work out well. The second challenge for neurosurgery, it is very intensive in human resources, uh, equipment, et cetera, which means that it is expensive. And if you work in a setting, for example, when I worked in the UK, it's a national health service. So the patients never needed to worry about how much something costs because if they needed it, the system would provide it. Now that I've come back to work, in Kenya um, and also before that in Tanzania, for the vast majority of the world, you either have partial insurance or, or the family need to pay. And so when you have an emergency and you're trying to explain to the family that you need this, this treatment that is really expensive for various reasons we'll talk about, that's really hard. I, I often have patients who are asking when they can go home because of the financial implications, which means you're thinking a lot about um, money is never that far off from your thinking process when you're managing a, a neurosurgical patient. And I'm sure it's also true for other specialities. Health is always more expensive than we think. Yes, definitely. We, we, at times when you do rotations here in the hospital in Africa, you see some patients who really uh, have a lot of issues. Those who are not insured and most of the patients don't have insurance. So it is a really a good point there. So Dr. Beverly, what is it like to uh, to train in the in the UK? Because you said part of your training was in the UK. So what do you uh, what what was it like to uh, train in in the UK as a neurosurgeon? So uh, I'd like to commend the, my my seniors who have worked really hard to create the training program that's there in the UK. I think one of the greatest privileges that I found was learning a little bit more about living in a country that has a national health service where care is provided based on need rather than uh, affordability or uh, access to it in terms of geographical location. So that was very, very important. The second thing that I learned in the UK was reflection. So evidence-based medicine and personal reflection for your performance and various ways of measuring how you did and why you did what you did. Um, so I, I, I learned a lot from that respect. In terms of how it is structured, um, we talked about the medical school and the internship. They have a national selection program. So about November, you, there's an application process. 
which then results in an interview process in February or March. And much like is happening at the moment in the States where you have March day, there's a day when you get your results. So there are, two, there are a couple of processes. You have to be able to be long listed. That means that when you see the list of what it takes to be in the program, you need to fulfill all the essential elements of it. And then when you inter and then a couple of people are shortlisted depending on how many points you scored. And then once you've been interviewed, and the interview is a combination of conversations, case-based discussions, and practical skills. I remember having to stitch and a few other things that they were assessing on your dexterity and how you think through a problem. Then if you're selected, you go into there are 32 different centers where, which accept on average one to two uh, candidates a year. So on average, really, it's about 16 to 30 a year who are selected for the population of 60 million. And then you have an eight year program that rolls between a combination of surgical specialities and critical care in the first couple of years. And then about four to five years of dedicated neurosurgery training and you move through the different specialities. So um, there's a lot that you get exposed to. There's, uh, I, I worked in South London. So I went through three neurosurgical centers, uh, which means by the time you finish training, you've worked with about 30 neurosurgeons plus. And that's, uh, it gives you a really good flavor of different processes and thoughts, ideas, and you also see very different populations. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, um, given that you start, given that you you train in the UK and now you came back to Africa to work, how was this? How was the transition from working in the UK to working in Kenya? Yeah, there's a lot that is in common. First, it was helpful that I trained in. I did my under uh, my pre undergraduate all in Kenya, so in a way it was coming home. But I, I was I, I, I grew up as a child up to my teenage years in Kenya and became an adult in Europe. So uh, the first thing was, where do I fit in? Am I European? Am I African? You know, that's uh, always a challenge in how I think. Um, the, the, the two countries are members of the Commonwealth. So there's a lot in, similar in terms of the knowledge and the books and things like that that we, we share. Um, what are the pros? So I've talked about having being a citizen, I already had friends and family and understanding colleagues. So in the transition, I remained very well supported by my chair of the department and the colleagues within my neurosurgical community. The challenges were the registration process. So if you're traveling from one country to the other, uh, there's a lot of things to get registered. So to come back to Kenya, first I had come back in the beginning to do my exams again, to be registered as a doctor. And then I had to go through a peer review process to be recognized as a specialist. Um, and then I also made that transition during the time of COVID, uh, which meant that the borders were closed. And I, I spent between March and August not knowing which country I was going to be in. And then there are health worries when you're transitioning during the middle of a pandemic. And when you're setting up a, a practice during the time of a pandemic, even the clinical practice on the ground is changed most of our meetings are now online so you miss the human touch getting to know people uh, i know people more by their voice but then how they look and then trying to build confidence with your patients that it's okay they can come in you can take care of them um yes i'm still i'm still learning i'm still growing but it's it's an interesting time to come home mm, thank you very much doctor and uh, um Eventually, you already mentioned some of the challenges that uh, you face as a neurosurgeon and generally, but as a neurosurgeon working in Africa, what are those special challenges that you have encountered and how do you go about uh, facing them? <laughs> yeah, and you're asking a very difficult question. Um, so I, let me just say what I've learned in the time that I've been in Tanzania and in Kenya. Most African neurosurgeons are pioneers. What that means is you're often the first or one of the first few within your hospital, sometimes in your whole country. I am fortunate that uh, in Kenya we are 37, but that's still inadequate compared to the population of, uh, I was checking today, 52.57 million, which means each neurosurgeon covers 1.4 million people. That's a lot. So when you're a pioneer, you're doing a lot of things at the same time. You're trying to build a practice, knowing what it takes. You're trying to equip your theater. You're going to upskill people who are working around you. You're trying to do patient education. So things like interviews and things like that. You're trying to educate your colleagues who are in other fields, what you do so they can refer people to you. Um, and you're also involved in health advocacy. You're trying to raise awareness for the conditions. 
Um, most implements and equipment are made abroad. So there are very few things that a neurosurgeon uses that are purely made on the continent. That means that when we are buying these things, we're buying them sometimes at the most expensive, particularly as I, as I said, you're a pioneer. So you're not even working on volume. You know, when you talk about economies of scale, if you're the, if, if you're, you know, in our unit, we are two full-timers and there are a couple of others who are part-time or private in the hospital. You're going to attract a different markup compared to centers that I've visited where there are 10 or 20 or 15 neurosurgeons. Um, community perception about what is good. In today's world where there's a lot of internet and things like that, uh, they, may, they may not be an appreciation for the skills that you can offer to your patients. Having trained in Europe, I would have to say this to anyone who practices anywhere. Medicine is as much a science as it is an art. And that means that when you're practicing it, it has to be relevant to your patient population, your resource availability, and other factors that are unique to the environment you're practicing in. So not everything that I have learned can be directly translated to the group of patients that I'm taking care of now. And I need to learn that and I need to be adaptable even when I'm trying to build my practice. Um, there are no clear referral pathways. When I was in the UK, the country was divided up, cut, you know, divided into, it was very clear, patients from place X go to a particular place. And, and, and that is very clear to the patient as it is to the doctors caring for them. So there's a stream that patients come in and how you refer them out for various services. The African patient still remains the advocate for their own health. And if you think about neurosurgical conditions that, for example, may affect your consciousness or your mental competence or your ability to mobilize, this can be a hindrance to how people seek their health care. Um, and that's a challenge. So we need to work on how people get referred to us. And if people don't know you're there, sometimes a patient takes a long time before they come to you. So they come at a more advanced stage in their disease process. And in a, for a neurosurgeon, we say that the best I can, I can often do is to stop you getting worse. So the earlier you come and seek my services, the better it is for the patient. But people don't refer to you or don't come to you because they don't know you. Um, there are challenges in developing or adapting a health system and, and also the skills deficit. So I talked about we're 37 neurosurgeons. We're only 14 neurologists in the country and two neuroradiologists, two neuropathologists for 52 million people. Now, you, and we don't have any dedicated rehab, neuro rehab specialists, and we don't yet have a neuro critical care in the country. So we share our critical care facilities. Uh, as well as other specialities like speech and language and physiotherapy. That might sound like a lament, but actually for those who are listening, this offers an opportunity. If you're looking at what you want to do, think about where those gaps are, because we need you. That's what I'm saying. We need you. We have so many things that we need people to go and study so that we can work together to provide good neuroscience care on the continent. Definitely, doctor. Definitely, and uh, given the, the 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 deficit in the work neurosurgical workforce that you have observed already in Kenya, uh, what will, what do you think um, somebody needs to become a neurosurgeon? What are those uh, aspects? What are those uh, qualities that somebody you believe somebody needs to become a good neurosurgeon? I think you just primarily need a passion in the subject. So there's one of the, um, as I said, we have a national selection and one of the consultants looked, uh, did a longitudinal study on how, what makes a good clinical neurosurgeon. And actually time, if you're given the exposure and the opportunity to learn, you will become a good neurosurgeon. What they cannot give you is a passion for the subject and a perseverance for the good times and the hard times that will definitely come no matter what you choose to do. You need to be willing to go through a long and intensive training. At the moment, we have a variability of training opportunities across the continent. And that means a lot of people have had to receive their training by going abroad or away from their families, case in point myself. At the time that I left Kenya, there was no neurosurgical training uh, opportunities at all. I am grateful to say now there are at least two programs. Uh, one is a COSEXA program, the College of a surgeons of East, Central, and South Africa, and also at the Kenyatta National Hospital under the auspices of the University of Nairobi, we have a WFNS training center. That means that Kenyans and people in the region now have a shorter distance to travel 
to acquire the same skills. But those who are listening, you may be in a country where you need to move somewhere else to be able to have that. You need to be mentored and supported. And in today's world, seek that even online. It, the, the mentors may not be readily available within your geographical location, but feel free to join organizations such as the African um, Future Association of Neurosurgeons and other support bodies like POHA so that we can together learn how we can uh, train together. Yes, so I just, just keep at it is I think what I, I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, doctor. And uh, uh, I believe uh, being a neurosurgeon who is not just focused on um, solving patients that you receive, but also trying to do some uh, medical education and uh, preventing patients from getting uh, worse diseases. What are your plans for neurosurgery in Kenya? So I'm, I'm pretty young in Kenya in terms of my uh, surgical practice. I'm six months old. So I, the first thing I have to do is understand the terrain that I have selected to practice in. And for that time, I am getting to know my colleagues who work here and uh, I'm constantly in someone's office learning how can I do this and how can I do that. I'm also a member of the um, Young African Neurosurgeons Forum and also AFAN. I'm also in the group, the Af Association of Future Neuro Neurosurgical, so that I can learn from others how to improve my practice. So the first thing I need to do is build a practice that's coherent, both surgically and how I manage patients regardless of whether or not they're having surgery. The next thing is to be involved in training. We have two COSEXA fellows at the moment with us and learning to train and teach is another skill set. Um, and for that, I'm grateful to be in a university hospital with a very proactive uh, chair and dean. And I'm hoping to be able to learn how to uh, be a neurosurgical trainer, maybe even you know, write exams, et cetera. And then uh, overall, be involved in the health systems development. And I will take those opportunities as, I, as they come my way. It's very difficult to predict. If I told you that uh, six months ago, I'd be talking to Jan Ompoha, I'd say uh, I, I would never have imagined it. So I'm gonna keep an open mind and see where I can be of, of use. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, so uh, what does a typical, what does a typical day in the life of a neurosurgeon looks like in your life eventually? So a typical day and you're a surgeon are not bedfellows. There's no typical day. So you do have a job plan. So my job plan has one day of theater, two clinics. I have an academic morning every Tuesday. Um, and, and then I have to round on my patients. Typically we round on them twice a day. And we have a, a team of uh, junior fellows and residents. We have general surgical residents who also cover neurosurgery. And then there are other meetings and planning sessions. The reality, however, for example, last week I was on call um, and I'm still on call at the moment. I operated every day of the week apart from Friday. So you, I remember coming home, telling my sister I'm going to bed and then 15 minutes later getting out because I needed to go back to the hospital for an emergency. It's not something that will have a fixed plan. So you need to just keep an open mind and, and go, go roll with the punches, just take it in as it comes. Mm, definitely. So your life is some sort of like fluid, like it's always changing. It's always changing. Oh, definitely. So doctor, uh, what are some of the advice? Because eventually... Sorry, I said you Sorry, need a structure. Get you... you need a structure. So you wake up in the morning with a plan, then you need to be flexible. But your plan may need to change at a moment's notice. Yeah, indeed. So... Uh, we need, uh, eventually we need to uh, get in uh, more young um, Africans into um, neurosurgery training programs. And uh, what are some of your advice for um, aspiring African neurosurgeons? What, uh, what would you tell them? Um, so the first is, you, there's, there's no substitute for, uh, first of all, keep an open mind, yeah? Neuroscience is wide. The, one of the challenges that you have, it doesn't matter which country you practice in, is that neuro, neurosurgery training places are limited. So a lot of people sometimes think, well, I can't be a neurosurgeon. I don't know what else to do. We need neuroradiologists. You know, a lot of coiling, for example, of aneurysms is done by neuroradiologists. In Kenya, we only have two neurosurgeons who can coil, which means many people never come to our attention. 
So keep an open mind to where the other opportunities may be. We need neurorehabilitation specialists. We need neuro-ophthalmologists. We need ENT that can do skull base. Uh, we need, you know, if you're even before university, we need speech and language therapists. We need uh, neurophysiologists. We need so much to be able to work as a team. So keep an open mind to where the opportunities present themselves. Two, join an interest group. So I've talked about AFAN. So there's also NANSIC, uh, which is a neurosurgery and neurology uh, students interest group that's in the UK that also is open to international membership. Join POHA. Wherever you are, use your online resources to access a wider group of people because where you are may not necessarily have a neurosurgical focus group or a neuroscience group. Um, get a support team together. When the journey is tough, they say you must carry more with you for the journey. So um, don't forget your friends, your important significant others, and have some colleagues that you can talk to so that as you're going through this journey, you're not so isolated. And that's important because there's an increasing awareness for the need for people to self-care so that you don't burn out. Mental health is a real challenge so that you have a support group around you. And then get a mentor and build your CV. And to get a mentor, you, you just have to try and reach out to people. So some people reach out to me, some people have reached out to other people. You may not get lucky the first couple of times, but there's always somebody who's willing to help you along the journey. Um, yeah, so, and be willing to travel. There's a paper that will come out soon about all the training opportunities in, in Africa. Um, so read that up and do your, do your due diligence in advance. It helps if you make yourself competitive. Are you doing audits? Are you doing presentations? Are you involved in research? Are you taking time, extra time to be in theaters and learn what the career involves? Um, you may need to learn a language because um, the training centers are either in Francophone or Anglophone countries. So depending on what your primary language is, there are Lucifone countries in Africa and one Spanish speaking African country. So you may need to learn another language to be able to train. There are various programs at the moment. There's the Africa 100 program under Majid Sami. There are uh, at least four WFNS training centers that you need to be aware of and find out how, what it takes to apply. Go to the Ministry of Health where you work and find out if they have opportunities either to sponsor you or may know of opportunities for neurosurgery. So certain countries like China, for example, Russia, uh, are opening up opportunities for neurosurgeons on the continent. So keep an open mind where you may be getting your training. And the key thing is just to get good core training, then you can top it up with whatever subspecialist interests. And indeed you may change your mind along the way as to what you want to do. Thank you very much for that, Doctor. And I wish to know, uh, speaking about funding, are there some special funding opportunities for Africans that Africans can easily get uh, those interested in neurosurgery? Um, this is a complex question. We did a survey of COVID uh, in neurosurgical trainees and of the more than 200 up, uh, people who responded, about 75% and, and less than a thousand US dollars and about a quarter had no income. So you need to really think hard about taking on long training and your financial situation. There are different models applied on the continent. One is if you have a primary hospital for which you're attached to, they may be willing to give you a stipend as you do your training. The second is if you have various family resources, so either you have your savings pool or you have a sponsorship from your parents, that may be a good another way or your partner to undergo the training. The third is you can, some training programs will give you a stipend, but it is rarely enough to just rely on that. So you need to think laterally and say, what, where will I fill in the gap? For example, I talked about, you may need to move countries. So additional expenses for you may be visa costs, flights home, um, money to call your family, et cetera. So you need to think about that. There are a couple of programs like the Africa 100, there are programs about uh, China has been offering scholarships. I think you need to speak to the Cannes president, Mahmoud Qureshi. There are some scholarships through FIENS that are to top up your training and the WFNS can offer a few scholarships. So the first thing is to identify where would you like to train and then look at the training opportunities around that. I talked about the Ministry of Health. Many Ministry of Health uh, officials, if you already have a training program or making the, the 
the effort. So recently, someone I know uh, asked me the same question. I said, look, write to your Ministry of Health and say, look, I've been accepted to this program or I'm considering this program. We have X number of neurosurgeons in my country. Is there anything the government can do to, to to support you. And you may find that they may have some small grants or access to scholarships that you're not aware of that may help you in your training. Thank you for that, Doctor. And uh, some few weeks ago, we celebrated uh, women in uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So what is your special advice for women and girls who, uh, who want to get into neurosurgery or who are already into neurosurgery? So we, we wrote a paper, uh, Yanis, uh, which was led by Claire Karakezi from Rwanda, and said that we have about 243 women on the continent for about 2,500 neurosurgeons. So 9% of women, of, of neurosurgeons on the continent are female, less than one in 10. But there is a difference in how they're distributed. So some countries like Algeria have over 40% of women, uh, over 40% of neurosurgeons are female. It's actually the highest proportion in the world and many other countries have none. So if you're a woman who wants to do neurosurgery, the first thing to know is it is possible. The second is you have to seek out the opportunities and you have to seek them out aggressively because there are few. And that means putting yourself out there, making connections on LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, you have to spend less than you earn. I always tell people, try and save when you can. So if you're in medical school, try and put a little bit of money in a pot. You never know when you'll need it because the application process, the traveling, the getting your health clearance, et cetera, those are expensive. Um, think about your support network, so your life partner. And, and I, so I don't say this in a gendered way. This is as true for men as it is for women. You need all the support you can to go through neurosurgical training. So your friends and family, your significant partner in your life, um, think very carefully about those choices and um, I, but don't let that stop you. You can combine your surgery and a family. You can train as a woman. You can, there are many people who are very supportive. And, and, and reach out to mentorship. So join surgical societies, use social media, reach out to people in university who may be able to help you. And then about women in... in so one of the challenges, I suppose, when people ask me about women in surgery is that my brain just says, why not? because I don't think there needs to be a special category for women in surgery. I think men and women are as capable of doing the job. So this is also a call out to men who may think that they're not suitable for neurosurgery. We need a variety of personalities and backgrounds to make this happen. So we all need you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, very important. And uh, uh, eventually neurosurgery is uh, extremely complicated, mm -hmm. difficult, and then it's a lot of, a lot of stress. Uh, comes into play. So what do you do as leisure? How do you manage your stress? How do you evacuate that stress? Um, so a, a little bit of stress is a good thing. A little bit of stress is what makes you rush for the bus to get somewhere on time. So the first thing is I embrace a little bit of stress. Um, my life has changed a lot before COVID and after COVID. So before COVID, my leisure time involved other people. So I liked to go dancing. I like to go eating out or to dinner parties, you know, hosting people. Um, I like to go to the cinema and watch a good movie. Um, and then when I wanted to have time by myself, I liked to walk, to read and to swim. Now, after COVID, you can notice a lot of those activities with social distancing are not happening. So now I have done a bit more Netflix than I would like to and uh, some family time. I've got a pet dog now that gives me a lot of cheer and music. I listen to Afrobeat a lot. I listen to Afrobeat a lot. Every time I need to cheer myself out, I'm listening to music. So yeah, my life has changed, but yes, it's still okay. Thank you very much. And uh, often we say neurosurgery is a very demanding field and uh, you need a lot of um, self-discipline. So uh, speaking about self-discipline, do you uh, think is uh, is uh, an, on your your own personal opinion, is it an important uh, uh, aspect for the life of a neurosurgeon being self disciplined? Yes, but there is nothing that in life that you will achieve without focus, purpose, and perseverance. Doesn't matter what it is. So in Kenya, we do a lot of long distance running. 
uh, what makes them long distance runners and not me, because they wake up every morning and they run. So you want to be a neurosurgeon, you have to be purposeful about it and actively seek opportunities that lead you in that direction um, and, and ditto anything in life. So self-discipline is part of being human and achieving anything you want. Thank you very much, Dr. Berry. We have a few, we have some questions in the chat. Uh, let me have, okay, somebody says, uh, Dr. No, you said Derek. Derek says, um, you talk about being assessed before being accepted into neurosurgery residency program. And that involves things like being assessed on dexterity. Does that mean that those that are not ambidextrous are not going to be accepted into, into the program? Do they have to do alternative residency programs like general surgery for uh, to to first improve their skills? So the core skills that were tested when I so this is particular to the UK selection process, um, and it's not very difficult to predict what they're going to ask you. Can you move something under a microscope? Can you suture, for example? Um, these are a way of you trying to you, because everyone will have said how they really enjoy it and they want to do it and they spend time in it. But have you tried to practice some of the basic skills? And they're not asking you to be perfect. They're trying to ask you to demonstrate some degree of competence. You don't need to be so ambidextrous to the point that you are a classical pianist of the highest order, but you need to have shown some effort into learning what it takes to do basic surgical skills. And that is a part of every medical program across the world. So if you want to do surgery, can you suture? Can you understand, you know, can you hold different instruments in your hand? Um, can you look under a microscope? Um, I think that those are fair enough. Um, now, you may be interested in neuroscience, but you're not interested in the surgical side. That's why I said just um, there, there's a funniest term they've been saying now in Kenya, which is you call yourself for a meeting where, you, where you're honest with yourself and say, my strengths are, and then you follow your path within the, your strengths. All right, thank you very much, Doctor. There is a, a, a there is a comment in the uh, um, chat which says, uh, "Doctor, very you are eloquent, intelligent, and very knowledgeable. I will, I it will be an honor for you to be my mentor." So you have somebody asking to be a mentor, and then if he, the person asks if um, there is a mentorship program, a neurosurgery mentorship program in the Aga Khan University Hospital apart from Kusexa. So to answer that, thank you very much, Mark. Um, to reach me, the easiest thing really is to get me through Twitter or LinkedIn. So my, my Twitter handle is at BevJeb. Um, or if you're within POHA, uh, you can just reach out that way um, or LinkedIn. So Aga Khan itself at the moment doesn't have a formal neurosurgery mentorship program, but the Aga Khan University has just developed a global mentorship program. So you could re reach out to us and write to us. Um, and see how we can help you. I don't know what stage you're at and what conversations we can have around what it takes for you to get into training. So would right. the thank you very I much. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, go on, doctor, no, go on, sorry. No, no, I think he was asking, what are, can a medical officer in your cases? And the answer is yes, but it takes your effort. So it, it, recently we had an intern who stayed on after work to come to theatre? It's that kind of interest where you 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 still have to do your day job, and then you need to do a bit of extra. Yeah, thank you very much for taking your time and accepting to uh, answer our questions today. So I'll give back the floor to Dr. Akri for the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you. There's actually another question in the um, Q and A. Um, uh, box, it says, what pieces of advice would you give on time management? I'm not sure if you answered, um, if you answered that one. <laughs> time management. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what? I think the first thing is don't be so hard on yourself. You won't, you won't be able to do everything all the time. I probably should have said that when we're talking about, um, what it takes to do neurosurgery. So divide your work into important, but urgent, important, but non-urgent, 
not important, not urgent, not important and urgent. And then ask yourself where you're in, where, where's the best place to put your energy on that particular day? That's the first thing. The second thing is, do you have to do everything? So you have to edit out things that maybe can be done by someone else. And I say this in particular when thing, it comes to things like uh, chores around the house or who has to do the cooking and stuff like that. When you're doing your residency, be kind to yourself and allow other people to help you and just let go of certain things. You, you won't be able to do everything. And then make a plan. So for example, when it comes to patient management, uh, one of the consultants used to ask me before every case, what are we going to do? So you go through it in your mind because once you've gone it in your mind, it's easier to do it. And then at the end of every case, he would go, what could we do better? So that's self-reflection where you say, I did one, two, three, but you know what? Next time, if I do it one way or the other, that will be better. And if you think this advice is applicable to everything, whether it's how you cook or how you run, how you manage the home, it doesn't matter what it is. Those two principles, think about what you're gonna do, the, you know, uh, visualize in your mind what you want to achieve. And then at the end of it, ask, how could I do this better? That's really, really, really good advice. Thank you so much. Can you just clarify that question, um, you know, about the how would I, a medical officer, try to be involved in neurosurgery cases? Um, you know, if they if they refer um, patients because you know and they don't have that service, what can that person you know what can that person do? So um, it depends where you are. So if you're if you're not within a neurosurgical center, you may want to reach out to somebody who works in a neurosurgical center and see whether you could come for a module, for example, or whether you could spend some of your extra time working with them in their particular service. And that allows you to have experience. Um, a place like Aga Khan has junior medical officers. So you may want to spend your year as a junior medical officer within the hospital and ask to be within the surgical field. That might give you access on weekends and evenings to be around a neurosurgeon. Then I talked about the breadth of the, of the cases that we manage. You may want wherever you are to maybe get involved in an audit. You might be able to speak to your consultant and a neurosurgical consultant and review maybe head trauma that come into your center or uh, you know, neuro infections. So there are many ways to make your mark wherever you are and try and improve the standard of care that you provide for your patients. And of course, make you more competitive to apply for a neurosurgical position. Thank you so much. As we're wrapping up, what, you know, um, final words, um, the famous final words of advice, <laughs> it's not the final words because everyone's still around, but, you know, what, um, what would, you know, you've given so many important messages, but, you know, for those who maybe joined in late, I know they can go back and listen, but what kind of, you know, words of advice would you want them to take? You know, what are some of the, the key points or the key point, key message um, you want someone leaving from this um, conversation to take with them? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I think the first thing is, uh, don't be afraid of the road less traveled. There are many things that are happening on the continent that were not possible even five or 10 years ago. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there and look for opportunities. And along the way, somebody will open their door to allow you in. Uh, leverage all the social connections that you can. And in today's world, use social media. Join associations such as POHA and AFAN and many other associations that offer mentorship because along the way, you will find a place where you fit. And also lastly, and also often commonly said, never give up. There's always a place for you in the bigger picture. It just, sometimes the road seems long, but you eventually get there. Wow, thank you. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, this, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Yvonne has also put his email for Afan. Um, as Dr. Chesserum has mentioned, um, you know, please, uh, you know, reach out. You can find her on LinkedIn. You can find her on Twitter. We, you can also look on the poor here. We have tagged her, or tried to tag her on both um, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, so you should be able to find her easily um, accessible. And then you can also find Yvonne um, as well. So the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons for anyone interested 
in um, neurosurgery. I mean, they've been doing an amazing, amazing, um, amazing work um, in terms of both mentorship, publications, just, you know, just kind of holding your hands and guiding you through the process. So if you're truly interested in neurosurgery, like she said, mentorship is the way to go. You know, it's, it's sometimes challenging to try and do these things on your own. So just reach out to them um, on the various platforms. Um, and Yvonne is the president of the um, Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. So his email is there, Yvonne Zolo. So Y-V-A-N-Z-O-L-O-V-I-E at gmail.com. And this is for those who are live streaming on um, Facebook. We can also type it up on that page. So Dr. Chesser, on behalf of Poor Hair, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, you know, I mean, like you said, you're on call and you've taken the time to do this. Uh, so we truly, truly appreciate your time. Absolutely grateful for this wonderful conversation. Um, Yvonne uh, did a fantastic job in asking the questions that, you know, even I, as a, a non neurosurgeon was thinking, you know, I mean, the, the training is just, uh, it's brutal, but as you said, it's focus, it's passion, it's determination. If you want to do something, you'll do it. Um, and with guidance, with support, um, you know, you've, you've done it and you continue to do it. And as poor hair, we are absolutely proud and appreciate your time. Yvonne, thank you so much as well um, for being a, a fantastic moderator and getting all the questions out there. Um, and these are balloons just uh, in excitement. Uh, <laughs> so, and on that note, uh, we will wrap this up to all those. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us. This has been recorded um, and it's live on Facebook. So you'll be able to watch this anytime. Uh, feel free to reach out and we look forward to our next session. Everyone have a fantastic, fantastic day. Take care. Thank you very much.